So thank you all for coming out on your afternoon. I'm actually on the West Coast, so it's still it's still my morning. But um, you know, we want to talk today. I want to talk today with you about story experience, and so um, bringing tourism experiences alive through storytelling um, isn't easy. Uh, I know there's a lot of challenges to it, and it's a complex, it's a complex endeavor, you know, and let's face it, bringing that unique flavor and specialness of what you're offering your visitor into a digital context is, um, can feel overwhelming at times. So I want to keep it dead simple today. And I want to just use a very simple object that we're all familiar with because we're all at different stages of our digital storytelling, right? Some of us are just getting into it. Some of us are DMOs that are very experienced. So we just want to be cognizant of that and inclusive of all of our questions. There's no stupid questions today, but I just wanted to start this way in a kind of simple uh, example so we can all relate and kind of be on the same page. So if I was bringing a lemon, to life, let's say through story, the very first place I would go is video. The fact is video remains uh, the best medium in media to show an experience. There's just no uh, question about that. And the first place I would go is to show, uh, I'd go straight for the babies. <laughs> So you get the idea. We have so much choice now, right? We have short form, long form, vlogs. I know some of it, some of you in the room are doing vlogs, uh, live streaming. We have motion graphics, visitor generated videos. There's um, a cornucopia of choice in terms of video, but it is a key story ingredient. And I'm going to be sort of referring to story ingredients in terms of how we put uh, a an experience together. So throughout this um, webinar, you'll hear me constantly referring to an ingredient and story ingredient. <laughs> photography. Well, we know photography does the heavy lifting, day-to-day -day heavy lifting for our digital storytelling. And, you know, if I was bringing a lemon alive, I would talk about the process of the growth of a lemon. That's a natural story to tell, right? So you, it's almost like a visual essay. You would think of where it was um, growing, how it was growing, how it was prepared, and then how a visitor would enjoy it, right? So there's a natural kind of story arc there. Um, so we know, you know, obviously in channels like Instagram, any social media channel, that thinking of the platform and how we frame it and how the user actually experiences our photography is so important. I often see, you know, photography almost um, minimized through the use of too much graphic design. And, you know, it, it really does minimize the emotional connection to a visual image. So that's something to keep in mind is you think of photography as a story ingredient to bringing your experience alive. Um, one of my favorite story ingredients is sound. It's the sound of a lemon being cut, right? It seems very simple and almost obvious, but you would be amazed how stories um, do, tend to not use sound as an element. And yet it's so powerful because it's a sensory experience that we have to tap into our imaginations to create a picture of the object or the experience. And when you do that, that's one of those story levers that you pull. That's very powerful, right? Ask them, ask the visitor to imagine the image. So I would encourage you to explore sound. You know, it's interesting. Um, Visit USA actually has an entire sound map that you can explore and dive into every single city through Spotify playlists. So if you're, they actually theme it up according to musical genres. So if you're a real jazz fan, you can dive into jazz and explore itineraries through sound. It's, it's pretty interesting. So, you know, I'd ask you, what is your soundscape of 
your place, of your hotel, of your experience, right? So I know some of you, I'm looking at you, Claire Stone, in, um, I know some of you actually have brought in traditional family songs right into an experience and made it very personal. And that was really successful. Um, just talking to the Bell Island Mine Museum yesterday, and they they have a beautiful song about their Clydesdale ponies that were used um, back in the day, and they are going to incorporate that into the experience, right? So thinking about your own personal soundscape and how that unique flavor um, can bring your experience alive for the digital visitor. And of course, um, color. You know, sometimes we don't, we're not conscious or intentional about our color, and yet we think of, you know, the color lemon and how many uh, different shades of it there are. If I was talking about a lemon, is it green? Is it ripe? Is it aging? Is it rotting? Where is it? And then what kind of mood does yellow convey, right? It's optimism. It's uh, the color of Ikea. That's no mistake, right? So intentionally thinking about colors. Some of you might have brand guides that have very specific colors, but playing around within your story world, within your brand story, and bringing that intentionally alive to convey a particular mood and emotion. Um, again, another tool in your toolkit. Texture and shape is also another aspect of our digital storytelling and a great ingredient. And we can use it very in a targeted way. So for instance, on the right-hand side, if I was had an agro-tourism experience and it was all sort of rough hewn and, and um, very organic and felt, you know, very much coming from the farm, or is my experience, I'm a restaurateur and you know, Montreal, downtown Montreal, and my shapes are very chic and I want it to look very modern, then I would um, create a very different kind of setting and use texture and shape in a way that was intentional to bring that experience alive. So the visitor almost enters into it and knows, oh yes, this is going to be a very precise, cared for, articulated experience. Or this is going to be the kind of experience that I love. I love going to a farm and being outside and getting my hands in the dirt. So again, just a, um, another layer to consider. If, um, you know, some of you might have a particular font that you use, but you know, I would challenge you to kind of open your, your, your minds up around how you're using your typography. So type you can have it very loose and free and written type, cursive type. That's a particular kind of mood. And that's a different kind of invitation than you see up on the top left where the kerning is very tight. Uh, it's very controlled. It's very designed, right? So we think about in the lower left, that farm experience, it feels a little less formal, right? So typography, and there's actually studies around typography that um, in 1933, Poffenberger and Barrows, a couple of scientists, explored how shapes and simple lines could communicate emotion. And their theory was that when we look at a line or shape, that that physical experience reminds us in our body language of how we express emotions. So there is a definite correlation between these shapes and our typography and the emotional experience visitors are having of your digital story. Now language, well, that's my favorite medium. Um, as some of you know, that are, have been through some of my courses with you, um, there's so much power in the language you use and the cadence and the way that you talk. And I'm just gonna ask you, you may not wanna do this, it might feel awkward, but um, close your eyes for a second. I'm just gonna read the first uh, stanza from this beautiful poem by Pablo Neruda. Out of lemon flowers loosed on the moonlight, Love's lashed and insatiable essences, sodden with fragrance. The lemon tree's yellow emerges. The lemons move down from the tree's planetarium. So we can't all be Pablo Neruda. I recognize that. But, you know, how many words do you think that was? 29. So you think of your social media. <laughs> That's not much, that's not much to convey that experience. And I'm sure some of you had images in your mind of how he was describing that lemon experience, right? So again, language is um, a powerful way to paint an experience 
really leaning on the visitor's imagination to draw them in emotionally and become engaged, right? It's that engagement that we all want with our, with our experiences and our visitors. So this is another aspect that actually blew up during the pandemic. And this is this idea of lessons, right? Where we're showing how to's. We're gonna talk a bit later about how this plays a very particular role in the visitor's digital journey, right? So um, Lemon Lessons, if I was bringing that experience alive. One of the I great ways to extract juice from a lemon is to cut lemon. it into wedges. What we like to do here, is cut fruit into quarters and then set the lemon at an angle cut out the seeds and scrape a few outliers here and you can squeeze your lemon into a bowl leaving your seeds out of your food so dead simple right and we all know how to cut a lemon but the idea is that you have thought leadership and you can express that in a way that draws a visitor in to your digital experience and helps them to understand in a way that's um, less, I guess, selly. It's, it's more about sort of education. And this type of content is a really essential ingredient uh, in storytelling. Interactive. Well, uh, I can't express this enough. This is just, this is just an element that you have to try and build into your stories because, you know, visitors are co-creators now. Their expectation of our stories is that they can con contribute, right? So it's very important to use those tools that are out there. I mean, gosh, you know, Instagram stories, you can pull someone every day. You can ask them a question, you know, ask them, what type of lemon should we use in tonight's, um, you know, happy hour? There's a sense of, a deep sense of reward when you do this with your, with your audiences. So it's again, a really important story ingredient that you intentionally can start to build in and play around with in your digital stories. And then again, you know, COVID accelerated the pace of augmented virtual experiences in tourism like never before. Um, the expectations of immersive tech and tourism are increasing every day with 5G connectivity. I mean, that's, that is really going to change the game. Um, there's a region in the UK that has launched, launched a project actually using the 5G UK test network, and they're exploring how tourism experiences and operators can actually boost a visitor economy. And um, the region, the West of England mayor, Tom Bowles, he has this vision, for instance, of bringing um, a new visitor experience in Bristol alive through imagining a virtual Roman soldier showing you around the Roman baths and imagine moving 360 degrees on your mobile phone instantly um, like you've never experienced before. So this idea that you can add immersion and VR and a augmented realities um, aren't about taking away from tourism, they're about enhancing tourism. So it's, it's another layer, it's a more complicated layer in some degrees, but you know, even having a 360 video is a beautiful enhancement and an immersive way to approach your storytelling. And so some of you may have heard me use this word transmedia strategy. So it is, a, it is one of those ways that you can extend your story world, right? You can grow your story world. But I wanna talk about um, an actual example. And this is something I found. And um, truth be told, I have not actually had this experience yet, but I definitely want to. Um, it is called Night Rise and it is the Banff Gondola experience that they created um, for this winter in particular. And it is a beautiful experience where I feel like the two layers, priority layers that were used in terms of ingredients for their experience were sound and language. And I'll just play this video to give you a little more background. <laughs> Ahibi wahiamba nain chuan 
imbibed the arts. The Mount Gondola is a popularly around attraction. People's primary reason for coming is to see the views and appreciate the national park setting. As you can imagine in the winter, there are less views in the winter evenings. So we uh, wanted to create an attraction within an attraction to uh, stimulate visitation on winter evenings. <laughs> Night rise, it's an immersive evening of wonder at the top of Sulphur Mountain. One of the big challenges we had uh, was to create an experience at night, but within a facility uh, that is used during daytime. So we needed to transform the space in an invisible way so that you cannot see it during daytime. For this project, it was really important for us to tell a unique story. And one of the stories that's undertold on this landscape is the First Nations uh, perspective and interpretation of the environment. Pursuit introduced us to the Stony Nakota Nation, which are uh, natives on the land. Throughout our conversation, we learned so much about the cultural significance of the sacred mountain. And together, we were able to define those wonders and develop the creative concept. This is one of those experiences of celebration. You get to celebrate um, this area. You get to celebrate what the mountains mean to the people that live here and the ones who have roamed here. So this is a great opportunity for our language and culture. To There's no right way to experience night fives. Uh, we invite guests to go up onto the rooftop or down onto the terrace uh, to look, listen, lounge, enjoy, and repeat. We expect to, to build business and volume into our white space, into our evenings, into our winter. The experience that we're building integrates really well with our pre-existing culinary offering to create a really holistic experience. We're hoping guests come, spend the whole evening here, um, and it creates a whole new aspect to our uh, winter business. In Stony, we don't have a word for goodbye. Instead, we say, Akes Unchimagatat. We will see you again. So a uh, fascinating challenge in terms of storytelling. Uh, it's an evening experience. It's, uh, there's a lot of um, complexity to that. But what I found through my digital experience and looking into the experience was this idea of, I love this quote, the harder you listen, the more you hear. Because Night Ride really, Night Rise really does bring alive the indigenous lens, the Stony Nakoda connection to the land and the sky, fires, stars, sun and moon in such a beautiful way. Um, so I wanna just show you three uh, examples of language. We talked about language and sound, right? So this sort of flips things uh, a little bit. It's an unexpected call to action, isn't it? It's listen to the view. It's quite powerful. Um, slow to the speed of snow. So the use of language there, you hear the alliteration and the pacing of that. And finally, look up and listen to the stars. So there's that beautiful call in the experience to do things differently, and to see things differently in our natural world differently, which is so beautiful. And throughout the experience, the moment you actually step onto the gondola, there is a central character. There is a central Stony Nakoda voice and, and narrator of the story that takes you from the very beginning through your whole visitor journey to the very end. And I found that really interesting as well. And that's something that they play with, um, you know, throughout the experience and in their digital marketing. So for instance, in this very short video, they have these great, wonderful little um, short motion pieces that are, do really well on social. And they personify Sulphur Mountain. They personify the place. And see if you can notice um, the call to action to the visitor in this short motion piece.
She might have missed it at the end, but she says, and she's waiting for us. Um, this is a this is a very beautiful technique, a story technique to use um, of personifying the mountain. And they do that through the whole experience. And it's also interesting when I was looking at the social conversation around night rise that um, the, vis the visual and sensory cues of sound don't go unnoticed. So their effort is really paying off in terms of their priority channels and their priority media for their digital experience. And um, yeah, this listen to the view in particular was really noted by visitors. But you know, uh, I would be remiss if I was to not talk about how the pan pandemic has changed how we experience tourism. Um, I think there's been a fundamental change and there is a way forward that's a little bit different. And, you know, one of the ways I think I saw a lot of folks trying to create and communicate to visitors that we're still here, you can still explore, but I uh, have to say that the Faroe Islands created maybe to me one of the most amazing immersive storytelling experiences during the pandemic um, that I've ever seen and I think there's some lessons though to pull from this that this isn't just to be considered an emergency band-aid but to say okay well going forward can we also create these kinds of dynamic experiences um, for digital visitors I'm just going to play this quickly for you <laughs> My name is Guri Heugert and I'm the director at Visit Faroe Islands. A few weeks ago, we had to ask tourists to not visit our 18 small islands because of the coronavirus. This was a difficult but necessary decision. Thank you all for understanding. Now that we don't have any tourists in the Faroe Islands, we have a lot of extra time on our hands. So we thought that we would give those of you who couldn't visit as planned and everyone else a chance to visit the Faroe Islands through us. We will be fitted with a camera and give everyone access to control us using their mobile phone. When you press forward, we move forward. When you press left, we turn left. And when you press jump, well, we jump. Each trip will begin in a new location. And as a virtual tourist, you can ride, sail, and even control a helicopter. So you can literally sit at home and control a helicopter in the Faroe Islands. Where we end up is up to you, as long as you keep us out of harm's way. You can take a free virtual trip at visitfaroeislands.com or follow our adventures on Facebook and Instagram Live. In the meantime, we look forward to welcoming you back to the Faroe Islands in real life. So pretty impressive. Um, I've actually ridden on their Shetland ponies. I've, I've done all those experiences there. You know, some of them are pretty kind of rough at first, but um, I feel like I know the place in a, in a really intimate way. And um, it gave me an ability as a virtual visitor to be immersed in their culture and their landscape in a unique way using technology. So, you know, I guess, where do we go from here? Uh, well, I think things have changed in terms of how we're telling our stories in a very visceral way. And that is, you know, establishing trust and connection with your visitor is absolutely critical. We have to be authentic. Um, you know, I often will see at the top of a beautiful landing page for an experience, this big red bold, you know, book here. And, and there's a sense now I feel that that kind of um, experiential storytelling is a little bit gone out the window. Um, so we have to think about how we are intentionally being inclusive and how by inclusive, um, inclusive, I really am talking about accessibility. So thinking about the digital experience of your storytelling for your visitor, uh, thinking about you know, what does it look like on their mobile phone for someone who's low sighted, um, for someone who's less abled? Um, thinking through these considerations for your audience shows you care. It shows empathy. And gosh, having a strong empathy muscle post pandemic in tourism is really like the, you know, the new black, right? Um, 
very important in your storytelling and crafting that content for every stage of the visitor journey is a part of that empathy and building that empathy muscle. So, you know, my mantra is always the right content at the right place on the right channel, but you know, how do we do that? Well, building a story experience for the, for the whole journey, you know, starting there, this was a screen capture I took from Destination Canada's webinar recently. And, you know, there's this, this beautiful graphic about the digital journey of the visitor, right? And these typical, um, steps that they go through you know it starts with aware and dream plan book experience and post trip so we've seen this digital journey this visitor journey for a really long time and typically it is presented along a flat line um but i sort of see things a little bit differently and i think you know we have a natural traditional story arc where we know there's exposition you know we all learned this in high school or earlier rising action there's a climax to the story there's falling action, and then there's a resolution, right? And the visitor journey follows this, if we think about it, right? They're dreaming, they're planning, they book, they experience the trip home, and then memory. And our digital storytelling activities really should be mirroring this all the time, right? So we think of, um, you know, I call this woo, uh, and some of you who've taken my courses know I call that those assets and those types of stories are in that dream phase, the exposition phase, and I'm wooing them. So I'm thinking, you know, this is this is a light touch. This is an awareness kind of story, right? And then as they get through that journey, I'm offering them and providing them with help and learning, you know, back to that story element earlier, where we talked about um, thought leadership, right? We're going to help them by giving them assets and pieces of the story that help them to complete that part of their visitor journey, that part of their story. And then, of course, you want to immerse them in the experience. And we talked, um, you know, when showed that quote about showing and don't tell, right, through Anton che Chekhov. Show me the glint of the moonlight on glass. Don't just tell me that the moon is shining, right? Show me. And then memory and sharing. Sometimes this kind of falls off. Well, the visitors left. You know, they've gone out of the hotel. They finished their kayak trip. That's it. I, what do I have to worry about? That Their story isn't finished. There's a whole piece of that resolution. And you, you can imagine going to a film and if someone stopped you right after the top of the second act and said, okay, bye. <laughs> you'd be like, no, no, what, what happens to the girl and guy? You know, where's the happy story? Or, or how does this story end? That, that's the most important part of your story. That's the part that visitors start telling other people. That's your word of mouth moment, right? So a very critical um, piece of that visitor journey to always think about. So you th maybe some of you are thinking, oh God, how do I put all this together? It's, it's kind of overwhelming, but there's some basics. There's some basics to the craft of storytelling that we can look at, but I would always encourage you, um, start with your visitor. This is just, I say it practically all day long, but really knowing who your visitor is and knowing those personas and, you know, it's very helpful that there's personas out there, you know, um, cultural explorer that, you know, every province offers, every GMO offers um, specific personas that are based on a lot of real um, research. But I would push it a further for yourself if you're an operator and you're offering an experience and you're trying to get into the nuances um, of this digital visitor journey is, is really bring them alive as like a real human being and really speak to your visitors. Um, it's very important. They are your central character. And what kind of stories do they need? Consider what kind of stories you figured out. Okay, these are my ideal visitors. What do they need at every stage of their digital journey? What are the dream stories, the planning stories, the experience stories, and memory stories, right? So that's that empathy piece is mapping that out in advance. It's also part of your content strategy work, right? Uh, the second thing is, you know, is your digital table set, right? And by that, I'm really talking about developing that core story about your experience. And this comes from having originally done your core story about who you are and why you do what you do. Like having that foundation, that second layer is having just um, a kick-ass story about your experience that is really, really polished and strong because that is again gonna be your foundation. Um, 
choosing your priority channels. You know, we talked about Night Rise, right? They they made some choices there. There's definitely a hierarchy. If you're everything for everybody, you're no one for anyone. So honing down, and as Truman Capote always says, or said, apparently, I'm quoting him, you have to murder a lot of darlings in storytelling. And if any of you have done editing, that's exactly what it feels like is murdering. It's very painful. But trust me, if you want your experience to come alive, you have to prioritize which channels you're going to invest in, where are you are really going to double down, what is the main um, story ingredient that you're investing in to bring that experience alive. And then prepare those assets for the entire journey in advance, right? So as much as you can anyway, and thinking about that channel and that experience. So, you know, just uh, something I see all the time is, you know, print media that's prepared for Instagram. And that's a wasted opportunity because you've got this graphic with maybe you've got a list of, you know, information about your event in the post. It's really hard to see. And it's really easy to scroll by, really easy to scroll by. Back to our, you know, funny little lemon video, that's harder to scroll by, you know? So thinking about what is the experience on each of your channels going to be across that visitor journey. And then defining a cadence uh, for your content. And this is thinking about that experience and mapping back, you know, to where you actually need to be begin in that dream stage? Is it eight months? Is it eight weeks before? What is that cadence for you as an operator or destination and talking about how you're telling that story? So cadence is, is really important. And then the invitation. You know, what is the kind of invitation you're giving your visitors? How are you bringing them into your experience? So I often see these words, right? It starts typically escape or then imagine and then join us and then book now. But I would challenge you to dimensionalize your experience more and think of your language back to the Pablo Neruda piece, you know, think of your language of, of wooing a visitor and dropping them into the story. So this is back to the show, don't tell, um, through the visitor lens. This is a very powerful thing. Tourism um, Destination New Brunswick just did it yesterday. Uh, I think it was on Instagram. They showed it was a visitor. It was a, a repost from a visitor, which is great. Visitor generated content, A plus, um, but they just put you right into the entire visitor visitor journey of a young man. He's going camping and he's having this amazing experience. And they really get into it's a very quick video, but I felt like I went on the journey with him. So that was great. Dropped me right into the experience. It didn't tell me, it showed me. Um, Pacific Sands, you know, if you want to grab your phone, jump onto their Instagram. They do this all the time. This is part of their story ingredient. This is how they invite me to their, um, and have that beautiful sense of arrival. So they show the float plane because this is a resort on the farthest edge of our country um, on Vancouver Island and the tide and the surf and the experience of flying into this resort is, you know, that's the Oscar moment, right? So they, put you up into the float plane and they fly you into the resort. And then they also, what's another way to get there? Drive through the rainforest. So they put you inside the car and you have the experience of driving into this wondrous, amazing, beautiful, rich environment. Um, and then they take you on the little walk towards the resort. And then they take you through your beautiful suite and out onto the deck and you hear the crashing and roaring of the surf. And there's this kind of visceral experience you're having. And then of course they tuck you in with your little puppy dog in their beautiful feather down uh, pillows. And you have this kind of lovely, quiet, peaceful moment. So, you know, it seems simple, but it actually takes more work because you, you have to capture these things, right? And you have to set this mood. And what I talk about in terms of setting that mood is, is using that sensory language, but also having your visitor generated content as just an absolute staple in your pantry, if you will, you know, bear with me using this analogy of, of cooking with story, but, you know, visitor generated content is the way that we have expectations around trust and infinity, right? 
Um, so I want to know, I want to see people like myself and vi other visitors experiencing the experience. It's just, a, it's just how we work. It's just how things are done. And it's a sense of um, they know better. And shining the light on your visitors is also, again, around that inclusivity piece, accessibility piece. There's all of those checks for showing and letting your visitor take your platforms and tell your story for you. And also in terms of mood, you know, traditionally in stories, you know, they always begin with setting, setting and context for the visitor. So before you start asking the visitor to take an action, you want to make sure you've set the mood. It's kind of a, one of those things where, you know, if you went out on a date, you wouldn't go right in for the kiss, <laughs> you know, you'd have conversation and coffee, right? So, um, so one of the, the last things, of course, is, is how we serve an experience. How do we serve it to our visitors? How do we capture this? right um just talking to a visitor or an operator this week and it they had a great beginning of their story but then it dropped off during the climax i'm like well what about the experience piece so sometimes we forget uh how to do this part and how to do this part it is really two parts to it there's two skills here story craft skills one is what i would call story spotting and story capture and story spotting, if you're a one person operator, it is, it's on you um, to capture and spot visitors having an experience. This is your, you know, the gold medal level of content that you want to catch them, capture them doing and spot when they're in an experience, having an amazing time, whether it's interacting with the environment, your setting, or interacting with one of your characters. So your character might be a guide, it might be your concierge, it might be the person giving the wild flower tour. Those are all characters in your story and they need to be mapped out. So you know your story hotspots. Like if I asked everybody to put up their hand in this room, you know, can you name me three of your, your story hotspots? That's where you, you just build in your story spotting. You know, it's if you've got new people coming on, you know, maybe it's a one pager for new staff to say like, hey, hey, you know, we really celebrate this part of our experience and we really want to capture it. So here's a camera. You're totally empowered to capture this moment. We support you and here's how you do it. Um, so, yeah, story spotting and story capture, they go hand in hand. Really important part of your practice all year round to bringing your visitor experience alive on your digital channels. But um, building a digital experience isn't done at a desk. If you're spending all your time at your desk, um, I, I would challenge you to get outside. Get outside, talk to visitors, take that little quick sound bite, you know, and, and pair it with a beautiful video. You would be amazed at how far that can go and it costs almost nothing, right? Visitors are your characters that can explain your story and offer the tangible and intangible benefits of that experience better than anybody. Um, highlight where there are natural challenges. When you get out in your experience and you're delivering that experience, maybe not all experiences um, have a really big challenge. You know, you haven't climbed a mountain, but there's, there's always something where there is a bit of a transition. It's why we use, so often use, and maybe it's a hackneyed phrase, but I still believe in it. It's the idea of transformation. But in storytelling, a transformation will not, does not ever happen without a challenge, without an obstacle. And for some of you, you know, who've just gone through my destination story course, we always talk about the tension in story between uh, intention and obstacle, right? There's that natural tension. So where you can find that in your storytelling, your digital storytelling, I really challenge you because stories like where you see, yeah, maybe you do see someone um, going up a rainy pathway, they've got a short pack on, but you're going to have a charcuterie experience at the top of that mountain. Then you show them smiling, wet hair, you know, having that sense of accomplishment. That's the climax of your story. So don't forget to build that in because you have to kind of think ahead, right? Who's going to capture that? Who's responsible for that? Are we capturing that? Are we spotting that part of the story? And are we communicating it to our visitors? 
So there's that natural um, story arc, right? That we always want to be following. Um, the fact is at every chance you get using story ingredients to fire up your digital visitor's imagination is the goal. That's your goal in, in storytelling um, for visitors, right? Because if you can emotionally engage them, you are more likely to change behavior. It's just a scientific fact, right? If we're not engaged with something, we're really not likely to book and spend money and travel and go somewhere, right? So using visual media that taps into our emotions, showing, not telling, cues and social proof at every stage um, of how the investment of my time and money is worth it and is transformative. Someone's got their um, quick mute to your sound, thank you. Um, and that will be with representatives of the Ontario government as... Uh, so your story is, yours not, in, is not yours alone, right? And we think about the visitor bringing their inner world to your story. It's co-created. Um, you know, there's this, this is kind of another one of those levers, if you will, that I talk about all the time. Marcel Duchamp said, the creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualifications and thus adds his or her contribution to the creative art. So in other words, it's a shared experience. And that's what the power of story, right? So this opportunity, I would say, um, the real opportunity and, and the answer to the question of like, why tell stories? Why does it matter? Is that your visitor is the central character of your story. If you are in tourism, that's it. And having them and showcasing them and focusing on them through every stage of their journey um, means that you will have relationships with your visitor you will have that trust and affinity and you will engender that loyalty and that revisitation and that word of mouth. And that will be the natural result of doing that. But I want us to do a little exercise and some of you may be like, oh my gosh, no, please. I didn't brush my hair this morning, but you don't have to have your video on. Again, we're gonna use our ears um, to bring this alive. And what I want you to do right now is take a moment grab a pen or paper, or just keep it in your mind's eye. I want you to think of one of your experiences. And if you're not an operator, think of an experience you've had, um, a tourism experience you've had. And I want you to think of a particular object, similar to the lemon, don't think of an activity. I want you to think of an object. So heck, it could be a paddle, in a canoe, it could be a crispy croissant that you had um, in a beautiful B&B &B overlooking the ocean one morning. Um, it could be an incredible cocktail made with local gin from a local gin distillery. So have an object in your mind. Everybody got it, got it, got it, okay. And um, I want us, oops, I want us to have a, a moment to talk about and practice. We talk about story muscle, right? We're going to build some of our story muscle, storytelling muscle this morning. Um, I want you to describe the texture, the shape, the sound. Maybe write this down or take a note on your computer. Texture, shape, sound, taste. Even if you think, oh my God, this doesn't have a taste, just try and smell of your object. Okay, and then we're going to break out into rooms. And again, you have to have your video on. This does not require video. Um, but if you want to keep your video on, that's nice for your partner. Um, and we are going to just spend a few minutes. Each person will have a chance, have about two minutes to describe these elements of their object and see if the other person can guess it. And then we're going to come back for question and answer. Sound good?